Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Seven Misconceptions About LED Lights, uh, hosted by FOES uh, in partnership with Cannabis Business Times. My name is Zach Mentz, Senior Editor at Cannabis Business Times. And uh, again, we really appreciate you joining us for today's webinar. Should be a really uh, exciting one. And we have some experts from FOES here to, to give you a little bit of uh, 411 about LED lights, their benefits, and some of the misconceptions that surround them in the market. Uh, for today's presentation, we have Tom Stanchfield, uh, Senior Vice President of Sales at FOES, Mike Howard, Grower Liaison, and Alex Gerard, Chief Technology Officer at FOES. The three of them will be taking you through a presentation today. We'll also have a Q&A available at the bottom of the webinar here, uh, where we encourage all, all of today's uh, attendees to insert your comments, questions, and after the presentation, we'll have some time at the end to just kind of go through a little bit of Q&A here. So um, any questions you have throughout, please feel free to fire away. We'll answer them at the end. And with that said, Tom, Mike, Alex, please take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Um, I'll do my introduction first and then kick it over to uh, Alex and Mike for theirs. Uh, as Zach alluded to, I am the uh, SVP of sales here at Foes Lighting. Uh, been with the company since inception and uh, yeah, helping folks all across the country and globe make the transition from either HPS, HID, or lower compact units over to Foes Lighting. So with that, I'll let uh, Alex do an introduction of himself. Yeah, I'm the uh, CTO and uh, head of engineering at FOS. Uh, co-founder as well, and uh, really just head up uh, light fixture design, uh, work with clients for the build outs of their facilities, um, and uh, just kind of manage over the, the uh, engineering at FOS. And I'm Mike Howard. Uh, I've been with the company for about a year and a half. I've been growing commercially with LEDs for about five plus years now. And yep, let's get it started. <laughs> Awesome. Will do, guys. Thanks for that. And uh, also want to thank Cannabis Business Times for uh, allotting this slot and kind of having us shed some light on, you know, some of the different uh, misconceptions in regards to LED lights. So as you can see, the title is The Seven Misconceptions About LED Grow Lights. Um, a lot of rumors and hearsay, you know, surround LED grow lights, um, whatever they're implemented. Um, so Mike, Alex, and myself are going to shed some light on some of the biggest misconceptions that we see in the marketplace today. Um, one of the biggest ones that we see um, is that if you change from HPS to LED, your yields will increase automatically. Uh, definitely not the case, right? There's a lot of different factors that go into obviously making the switch over from HPS to LED. So um, if you get your environments and uh, everything else dialed in, you know, the VPD, uh, feeding, um, environmental parameters, and most importantly, your genetics, um, you definitely will see increases. Um, but definitely want to shed some light uh, on that transition. Um, you know, that's why we have a, a grow team uh, with folks like Mike is to help our clients really, uh, you know, kind of gear them up for success and enable that. Um, so, you know, hanging a 1500 watt fixture um, in replacement of an HPS 1000 watt fixture isn't going to automatically increase those yields. Um, working with our horticultural team um, and getting those environments and everything else dialed in, um, that's where, you know, the rubber kind of meets the road. So, Really want to work with you guys um, as you guys make the transition to ensure that those yields do increase. But that is definitely a fallacy that if you just hang an LED versus an HPS, your yields will increase. So Mike and Alex, I didn't know if you had anything else to add to that. Yeah. Yeah. If this is done well, I mean, you could definitely get an increase in yields. LEDs are able to provide more photons to your canopy um, compared to HPS at the same wattage. So if you adapt kind of, you know, your environment, your irrigation strategy, your feeding and do it right, you should definitely see an increase in yield and quality. Um, but just swapping out your light and thinking you're going to get a huge increase. Uh, it's not how yeah. it's not always how it yeah, goes. Yeah, exactly. As an example, I mean, we have people that go from um, 800 PPFD, swap out the lights and now have the ability to go to 14, 1500 PPFD but they don't increase their watering. They don't increase their feeding. Everything else stays the same. Uh, and they go right up to those light levels and then they actually damage their plants because the plants can't keep up with that amount of light. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, swapping all the lights definitely gives you a fast race car, but you gotta know how to drive the thing too. A hundred percent. And the window of success becomes, you know, more narrow, the higher the light levels go. Sure. So if you miss an irrigation and you're hitting your plants at 1500 PPFD, 
it could be extremely you know detrimental to that plant. Right. If you're only at 800 ppf, you miss an irrigation. It's it's probably not the end of the world. <laughs> right. Perfect. 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 Thank you, guys. All right. We'll go on to the next misconception here. So another misconception that we often see in the marketplace is that uh, LEDs grow larfy or airy flower. Also false. I think you guys will see that will be a common theme in all of these slides, but <laughs> uh, just to it, uh, there are definitely many factors that play into larfy flower, right? It's, it's a common misconception that LEDs will automatically grow these, uh, but definitely not the case. Um, you know, definitely some of the contributing factors to, you know, larfy flower um, are the inability to control spectrums. Um, some of the older generations of LEDs that are in the marketplace today. Uh, and then also, um, you know, being able to, you know, swap out lower compact LED units for something like our, you know, Fo's A3i, right? That's a 1500 watt fixture um, that enables all of our growers to ensure that light will never be your limiting variable. And also gives that spectrum control to give the plant exactly what spectrum it needs throughout the duration uh, of flowering when it needs it. So, Mike, obviously you've used these fixtures and have helped you know thousands of growers across the country implement these. So, you know, feel free to kind of share you know some of the things that you've seen in regards to avoiding you know larfy flower. Yeah, definitely. And I think you saw this a lot kind of with the inception of LEDs back in the day. And I kind of first first handedly saw it with those lower powered or purple LEDs that were kind of first to the market uh, when we saw LEDs kind of start transitioning into commercial mm -hmm. cannabis. Um, now with, you know, fixtures like the A3i having that higher output, you're able to get those higher light levels. We're not just matching the light levels of HPS anymore. We're, we're able to far surpass them. One of the other great things about kind of our flagship series, so the A3i, the Aries, the Scorpios, is that ability to control the spectrum. So our autumn spectrum has a high concentration of reds and far reds. That's going to provide, you know, better, pe better canopy penetration. It's going to get those lower buds denser. Um, make sure you're getting, you know, quality packageable flower pretty much throughout your canopy. So. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. We'll move on to the next slide and remember to ask your questions too in the chat. So that way, you know, Mike, Alex, and myself can answer all of those at the end. All right, another misconception that we see is that LED flower can't compete with the quality of HPS. Again, definitely not the case. Um, definitely some learning curves as you're transitioning from HPS into you know, an LED system, um, you know, with regards to ramping up the intensity, changing the spectrums, things like that. Uh, obviously with HPS fixtures, they produce a significant amount of radiant heat um, so that gives obviously uh, a lot of issues within the grow, right? You have a lot better chance of burning off uh, the terps, uh, obviously within the plant uh, versus with LED, you can preserve those running at a, a lot cooler uh, heat, obviously within the grow room. Um, that'll definitely affect the quality and the bottom line. Um, let's get all these up. There we go. Um, so it's too hard to hit the product's bottom line. So, um, you know, the gist of it is, right, you're, you're enabling yourself to really push the plants a lot further from a PPFD level perspective versus HPS, right? If you ramp up HPS all the way to 100%, you got to get rid of that heat within the room versus with LEDs, you're going to run the rooms a lot hotter because they're not putting off that black body radiant heat. So being able to shift and, you know, use our horticultural team um, and get those environmental parameters dialed in. Um, you'll definitely be able to compete with the quality of HPS with LED. Um, and as also when we, you know, founded this company, you know, we did a, a case study on 40 different harvests uh, versus our flagship A3i model versus HPS fixtures. Um, and we can send that out after, but basically the bottom line is, you know, we increased the THC count by about 3%. Uh, the terpene profile rose about two and a half percent. So, definitely you can get better quality and significantly more medicine when making the shift over from HPS to LED if it's done right. Yep. And kind of what we alluded to before, there's, there's always nuance to the situation, right? So if you've been growing with HPS for 10 years and you take all your genetics and you do your first run of LED and it doesn't all knock it out of the park, uh, you have to dial in this new system, right? So kind of what we alluded to in the last slide, environments, uh, feeding, all those other things have to be adapted and changed 
to make sure that you're you're still getting that high quality that you saw under HPS. Perfect. Perfect. All right, moving on. All right, another misconception um, that we definitely see, and I definitely hear a lot, you know, being on the sales front, is that LEDs don't have the penetration of the HPS fixtures. Also, uh, another big misconception. Uh, let me get this whole slide up here. Um, so HBS obviously has been tried and true for, for many, many years, right? Folks have been using these for 30, 40, 50 years and, and been successful, you know, cultivating cannabis across the globe. Um, you know, the biggest difference is, is kind of the single source light with an HID or, or HPS fixture, right? It's a single source of light. So whatever that light hits is where that light's going to stop. Um, and as you can see here um, on our A3I and all of our fixtures, we have 180 degree lensing. So basically like a flashlight approach, right? You hold it up at night, you know, the light dissipates evenly. Um, so what that means for our growers is, is that that light is going to penetrate significantly deeper into the canopy, giving you guys significantly more penetration. And obviously at the end of the day, creating more um, from a yield standpoint and getting more ABC buds down obviously to the canopy. So Mike, do you want to shed some light or Alex, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the lensing, of course, like you described, takes the light from leaving the fixture at a wide angle and sends it a little bit more direct into the canopy. That helps in a lot of different ways. Uh, like if you picture uh, holding a flashlight close to your hand, uh, your hand's going to make a huge shadow. Uh, that happens a lot with LED lights that don't have lenses on them and people put the light fixture very close to the canopy. The top uh, layer of the canopy uh, basically produces a much larger shadow over the bottom uh, in our canopy. Now, if you put lenses on the lights and you're able to raise that up, the shadows that are created by the top of the canopy are a lot smaller and you're able to penetrate into the canopy much better. Um, you know, also with the, uh, just the, the, the tunability of the spectrum and really being able to aid to the life cycle of the plant, um, you know, that also helps to, to, to maintain good health quality down in the canopy and, uh, and strength of the light in the canopy. Perfect. Mike, do you have anything to add with, you know, the different spectrums and, you know, kind of the far reds kind of, you know, dissipating further in the canopy or anything to add on that? Yeah, I think we'll jump into that in one of the next slides. Okay, perfect. Well, hold your breath. <laughs> All right. Another misconception that we see um, is LEDs don't generate enough heat. Get all of these up. All right. So this is a very common uh, misconception when in reality, you know, no matter what, you know, whether it's coming from an HPS, an HID or an LED, right? Um, you know, science is science. So 3.41 BTUs is generated per watt, no matter what fixture you guys are using. So um, first of all, you know, controlling the environmental conditions in a hot um, you know, arid conditions like, you know, for instance, Nevada, California, Arizona, you know, Israel, things like that. Um, it can be a very big challenge when using HID lights um, with such hot environments outside the facilities as well. Uh, two, obviously growing with LEDs typically requires higher ambient temperatures uh, in the room. And Mike will kind of shed some light on what he sees kind of a, a good sweet spot um, for making the switch to LEDs versus the HPS rooms. And number three, uh, the intense heat that radiates from HID systems is also a major fire hazard, um, especially when implemented in small confined grow spaces with hazardous materials. Um, obviously, you know, that's the worst case scenario, but, you know, in doing this for seven years, it's happened around 15 to 20 times where people call me up and have to make the switch, uh, not by choice, but because of a fire had occurred because of a bulb shattering within their facility. So. Uh, and then fourth, uh, last but not least, uh, LEDs will produce the same amount of heat with 30% more light uh, with the energy efficiency diodes, which also will save your facility a ton of money, uh, which is also good for your pockets and also the planet. So, Mike, do you kind of want to dive into, you know, the environmentals, um, you know, what's a good temperature to run LEDs versus HPS and, and all those fun things? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, typically in the past, you'd see HPS growers running in rooms around you know, 75 degrees. Yeah. Uh, main reason for that is, is that radiant heat that's actually, you know, heating up the, the plant canopy, heating up the leaf surface. Uh, with LEDs, you don't have that radiant heat that's basically uh, 
pushing heat under your canopy. So the temperatures or the ambient temperatures in the room need to be raised quite a bit. So we typically see the low point of LEDs being around 78 degrees, uh, but typically we see people being between 80 and 85 degrees um, throughout the majority of the cycle with LEDs. Yeah, air temp, right? Air temp, air yeah. Temp, yeah. And that's something that's important to differentiate is your radiant heat, which is uh, coming directly off the bulb, almost like the heat you can feel next to a fireplace when the air around you isn't, isn't hot, but you can feel the radiation coming off of the embers. That's that radiant heat. Um, and so the, uh, you know, keeping that differentiation is important. So the, going to LEDs, your ambient air temperature can be higher because you don't have as much of that radiant direct heat from the uh, HPS or HID. Uh, so it's all in an end goal to get your leaf surface temperature at the right point, right? So you can maximize photosynthesis. Yep. And at the end of the day, I mean, even if you have a consistent ambient temperature of 82 degrees in your room, that leaf surface temperature is going to vary slightly throughout the day. Just as that plant is transpiring, it's going to cool the leaves. Right. So depending on how you're irrigating, um, that can change your leaf surface temperature as well. And, and how good or how bad your airflow is, uh, is also going to impact that leaf surface temperature as well. All right, thanks guys. All right. Another misconception here is that LEDs lack spectral options. Uh, definitely not the case, um, especially when, you know, looking to purchase some foes fixtures. So let me get all of this up before I go into it. Um, you know, with foes, um, Alex is obviously our CTO, built and designed all of these fixtures. Um, Mike alluded to this. Our flagship fixture is the A3i. Um, we also have the Scorpio and Aries fixtures, which all have three different spectrums. So um, obviously we have a spring, a summer, and an autumn spectrum. Um, I'll let Mike kind of dive into when to change those spectrums and when to, you know, when's the best time to kind of promote each one of those spectrums. Um, but typically with, you know, an HID or an HPS lighting fixture, you have, you know, probably seven different companies that are going to be pushing these out. Um, LEDs, obviously, as you guys know, there's almost a new LED company on the market each and every day. Um, be careful on who you, you partner with from an LED perspective. There's only a handful of companies that are really kind of pushing the envelope in regards to spectrum change. And FOES is definitely at the forefront. So, Mike, I'll kick it over to you to kind of dive into, you know, the spectral changes, you know, what that does for the plant and, and why we do what we do here. Yeah, um, as far as our spectrum goes, I kind of like to use it to uh, control or manipulate the plant morphology, right? So if you are vegging with one of our tunable spectrum fixtures, you're going to want to be in spring. It's got a higher concentration of blue. It's going to focus more on leaf development and keeping that structure compact. Um, if you're using it for flower, we see people kind of using a variety of methods. Um, but if you want to keep that stretched down, that internodal spacing pretty tight, you're going to want to keep it in that spring spectrum as well throughout part of stretch, um, just to you know, create a more compact structure. As you go into summer, those blues will start to drop off, reds and far reds uh, will start to increase. So that's good for you know, flower bulking kind of after week three. Um, autumn, you're going to drop off significantly in uh, the blue spectrum, and you're going to have the highest concentration of reds and flower reds to really promote canopy penetration and flower ripening. Perfect. And, and one point I kind of missed on here is uh, right in the middle here um, is, you know, how long these fixtures last, right? Um, you know, on average, LEDs will last for around 50,000 hours, um, which is about 10 years of use compared to an HPS fixture. Um, that is spec to last, you know, eight to 12 months. So it's kind of one of those things, you know, it's a, you know, cheap up front, obviously to get these HPS fixtures installed. Um, but with foes, you know, if you guys were willing to invest and, and work with us, you know, it's definitely going to have a payback period. That's a lot quicker um, than your HPS is and something that's going to be built for long-term sustainability. So, um, you know, as we know, you know, markets like California, Colorado, um, you know, prices have definitely dropped. So, the folks who are going to be, you know, standing at the end of the day in all of these uh, different geographical locations uh, based off their markets are the folks who are growing the best quality uh, for the cheapest amount at the highest efficiency. So definitely something that FOES enables all of our clients across the globe to do. Um, so it's definitely a key point that I wanted to make sure we hit on. We'll head into the next slide, which is the end. So 
want to thank everyone, uh, obviously, for attending. Uh, again, thank Cannabis Business Times for allowing us this slot to kind of shed some light on the seven misconceptions of LED lighting. Uh, feel free to download our specs there. All you got to do is take a picture. Um, that'll bring up all of our different foes fixture offerings. Um, and with that being said, thank you, Alex, Mike, Zach, and everyone for setting this up. We will open it up for questions for you guys. Yeah, and we're... See. Yes, so we have uh, a few questions here in uh, the Q&A here. Uh, please feel free to um, insert more questions as we go along here. We'll try and squeeze in as many as we can. But let's start off the top here. Uh, a few different questions for you guys. Uh, feel free to, to take this, whoever feels most comfortable with it. But in a question from Sam, do you foresee LED technology advancing in a way that will eliminate the blue spike in broad spectrum, uh, spectrum pictures? Um, yeah, I think this kind of goes back to um, our flagship series with that suitable spectrum. So a lot of the LEDs that you see that are fixed spectrum and just using it throughout the cycle will have kind of a higher concentration of blue in that fixture. Um, this is, always isn't the best sometimes with, you know, that increase in blue spectrum towards the end of the cycle, you could get some of that revegetative growth. Um, so that's why it is super nice to have that control. So you can eliminate that that blue spike towards the end of your cycle and eliminate that 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 type of growth. Yeah, and something to comment on that too is if um, you know we get the blue uh, tones in our spectrum from from full spectrum LEDs, so it's not quite as spiky. Of course, it is uh, you know a little bit there, but some LEDs actually use. Um, uh, wavelength specific diodes, and then it can be a lot harsher of a spike. Uh, so you really want to be utilizing LED fixtures that use full spectrum white diodes. That way it's uh, uh, a lot wider bandwidth worth of, of spectrum and a lot uh, uh, more natural for the plant. Yeah, and those those fixtures, I think you kind of alluded to, or what people call those blurple fixtures. Yeah, can, a lot of those, yeah. pretty much see it. Yeah, it's, exactly, yeah. Very uneven. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Alex. I had another question in the audience from Marco. Uh, Marco says, just curious, where are your LED components made or assembled? Um, yeah, we do. Uh, uh, we assemble overseas. Uh, the uh, companies that we work with, like Samsung and Osram, they, uh, their production facilities for the, the chips themselves are uh, in the same region. So we actually... Um, before shipping them all over the world, we populate them onto circuit boards there. Uh, just uh, geographically makes more sense and uh, streamlines the assembly. And on that same note, do you guys serve the international market as well, or is it U.S. only? Uh, international, yep, definitely. Awesome, awesome. Uh, another question uh, from Paul. Uh, when you change your spectrum, do you lose any output from the fixture? No, so if the if you have it set like if you have a thousand watt fixture from us and you have it set at one hundred percent, regardless of what spectrum you select, it's still going to be uh, a thousand percent. Um, we actually do that in a um, uh, what's been a little bit more difficult to engineer, but a really nice system that so our power supplies in it are thousand watt power supplies, and then we can basically manipulate the power that comes out of them to control. Uh, where it goes and what LEDs it goes to after that. Um, other competitors will go uh, kind of, um, um, I don't know, I'm not going to, I don't want to say lazier way, but in a way it is, you, if you have different channels, LEDs, you take a driver for each channel, uh, but then you have 1500 watts where the drivers for a thousand watt light fixture. Uh, and it's just components that you, uh, it's more components than you're using at any given time. So your build cost goes up uh, and uh, it's just not the right way to do it. So um, yeah, sorry, kind of a long winded answer there, but yes, if it's, if you're set at a thousand Watts, uh, regardless of what spectrum you select, it's always going to be a thousand Watts. I know I think long winded answers are a good thing. I'm sure there's so much to cover with led lights and, and as Tom and you guys pointed out during the presentation, a lot of misconceptions. So, so people certainly looking for some clarity there and you guys are able to provide that. Uh, another question here from uh, Vesco, what is the average power percentage people use with a 1500 watt light during flowering? 
ahead. Yeah, uh, the question is a little bit nuanced, but I think it comes down to the light levels that you're trying to achieve. Um, so if you're looking to hit your plant between 1,000 and 1,200 PPFD, three feet from the canopy, you're probably going to be around like 80% or so. Yeah. Um, if you want to drive those higher light levels, um, get that fixture a little bit closer to the canopy. We don't recommend too close because then that'll eat away at your uniformity. Right. Um, but right around, you know, two to three feet is kind of where we see those good levels. Um, but typically we see people using it anywhere between 70 and 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely a ramp up, right? You never want to take plants out of veg, bring them into your flower room and then just throw it out hundred um, percent. It's, it all needs to be incremental every couple of days as your plants um, are going through that initial stretch and in flower uh, and really fully aiding out all the way and going into flower. Uh, you keep ramping up uh, your power levels accordingly. Uh, and again, like we touched on earlier, that has to be in sync with, with how you're feeding um, so everything kind of ramps together and then you really just do it incrementally every couple of days, stepping that up and, uh, and of course, watching your plants. But that's how you can very uh, healthily get to 100 percent or, or that like, you know, 1500 PPFD level um, and really get those high yields and high quality. Uh, but again, it's, it's important that everything ramps together and you, and you watch the plants and that it ramps slowly so you don't shock them. Yeah, especially on that first run too, if you're not comfortable, you know, hitting your plants with those higher light levels, kind of slowly go into it so you can observe anything that happens as far as, you know, deficiencies that start to arise in the plant. If you're not hitting it with enough volume of feed, um, just anything that might need to be adapted as you kind of go into those higher light levels. Awesome. Uh, we had another question from Laborio who says, um, uh, comparing LED with HPS, uh, LED checks all the boxes. However, I notice a decrease in resin production with LED. Could this be due to a lack of UV? Uh, I tried dimming the lights the last few weeks and also changing to spring spectrum, but no difference. Um, I think it's less UV. I mean, because when you look at the UV in an HPS light compared to LED light, I mean, there's... Yeah, you can some of that, but, uh, you know, we've ran a lot of tests too with, because we, we build all sorts of lights and we've built a bunch with, with UV as well. Um, and a lot of those, the levels were similar, um, even when using, you know, nighttime cycles, of UV, all sorts of different things like that we've tested, but, um, you know, it, it came back to, uh, how were we feeding them? And, and what we found is that when the plants were not quite getting everything they needed, uh, we could see positive results from UV, uh, when the plants were in an optimal space with, with how they're being fed and illuminated, uh, we didn't actually get positive results from uh, using UV. So um, it's kind of hard to answer perfectly without diving deeper into, um, you know, what, what feeding is and everything like that. But, you know, if you want to reach out after this, we can definitely dive deeper into that. And I think just one of the things that we see quite often as far as side-by-sides go is someone's going to be doing a side-by-side -side in the exact same room to test out a fixture, which always isn't the greatest way to do a side-by-side, -side, right? Because you're either going to be steering the plants more towards the environmental and feeding conditions of an HPS uh, room or towards an LED room. So if you're hitting the plants with the same feed, uh, you have an HPS light and an LED light that's in that same room. On the same you, feeding line. Exactly. Yeah, you're steering yeah. the plant towards one system or the next, right? right? So if you're steering it more towards HPS, then you're probably not feeding enough for that LED light. And then you might get detrimental effects like less resin production. Gotcha. And, and Alex, you just mentioned there how um, attendees and interested um, uh, operators can follow up. How can uh, attendees follow up with you guys after today's session? Um, Tom, you want to, what's the best yeah. route for that? Yeah, absolutely. I got you, Alex. Um, yeah. So you can obviously just go to www.foes.com. Um, on there, we have a, a sheet that you can fill out. Um, and then one of our sales reps, um, will be able to reach out. Um, if it's a technical question, just kind of state that that way we can make sure we have, you know, someone from Alex's team on there to kind of help out from a technical standpoint. Um, also if it's like a horticultural question, just kind of elude those questions. So that way we can get to someone on Mike's team to best make sure that we can best answer whatever question you guys have. So, um, I'm not sure if we can pop that on the screen, but it's just www. 
F O H S E dot com. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we had uh, some more questions in here. Another one from Paul. What diodes do you use in your fixtures? Diodes. Uh, yeah, we use, uh, um, you know, a couple different options depending on, on what the fixture is, whether it's greenhouse or indoor. Or, uh, but, you know, the, we test a lot of them. Uh, we go with the, the ones that we get the best results from, um, which a lot of the fixtures are utilizing Samsung's 301 series uh, diodes. But uh, uh, again, you know, it's all kind of specific on, on, on what we're building specifically, but, but we do uh, utilize Samsung uh, heavily um, uh, in that selection. Awesome. And can you guys, uh, can you share what the raw power supply requirements are or recommendations uh, for a 480V, a three phase uh, recommended or required? Um, uh, I guess I'm not entirely sure what the question is, but the, uh, the fixtures are all single phase. We do have two options. We have a low voltage option that accepts anything from hundred volts up to 277. Um, again, single phase. And then we have a high voltage that does 277 up to 480. Um, you know, don't be, uh, discouraged if it is 483 phase, that just means you can run three separate circuits of 480 single phase a piece. So, uh, no issues there. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, pretty wide accommodations there for voltage. And also awesome. just to add on to that too, from, you know, like a power uh, daisy chain standpoint, obviously with 480, you'd be able to daisy chain more from a power consumption standpoint. Uh, and then for communication cables, that's all daisy chain fixture to fixture that will then tie into our controller or, you know, any of the Argus's grow links uh, of the world as well. So either way you can use our controller or, you know, a third party, we're able to tie into anyone. Yeah. Awesome. I had another question in the chat here. Uh, what are the advantages of a variable uh, LED light? Uh, variable, uh, assuming spectrum there, uh, it's um, really just catering to the different uh, growth stages of the light, so, or the plant. Um, so even like our, our A3I, our flagship light, you know, it's variable spectrum. Um, and it uh, it gets very, very close to our vegetative spectrum it doesn't go all the way uh to that side of the the scale there uh, but what it enables people to do is when they bring plants from a bedroom into the flower room um you can keep it in what we call spring uh if for that initial transition it just keeps the uh, amount of things that are changing for that plant at one time at a minimum um and then you know in your at the end of flower you want a lot lower blue levels, uh, much higher on the reds, um, or kind of Kelvin temperatures are another way to look at it for your full spectrum whites. But, um, you know, a lot changes. So the, we just kind of ramp it throughout that flower cycle into the spectrum you want to be finishing at. So it, uh, it just improves plant health. It uh, improves your, it can improve your yield by changing the spacing between nodes on your plant. So that the overall structure is a more natural, healthy structure, which is, you know, it's going to optimize how it grows because it's, uh, at the end of the day, it's growing those flowers to be able to be pollinated and produce seeds. Of course, we're not doing that in this industry, but, uh, um, you know, you want it to be as healthy as possible and getting uh, the most natural structure because that's how you get your highest yield. So we, that's what we use those spectrums for. And kind of what a overlooks factor having that spectrum tunability is, I mean, there are some facilities, while not ideal, only have like, let's say one room to cultivate it. Uh, you can, Absolutely. you can then vag in place um, and flower within the same room. And anyone who's tried to do that with HPS, you know, kind of knows that when you're vegging with HPS, you're going to get some, some lankier plants and it's not always the ideal spectrum to have for vegetative growth. Um, so with those tunable fixtures, uh, you can kind of hit all the growth stages in one room if need be. And this also kind of ties back into even the home growers out there, right? You have one fixture that can kind of do it all. Most home growers don't have multiple rooms to badge or flower. Um, so you can kind of hit all those growth stage within the same space. Right. Good point. Awesome. Uh, winding down, a couple more questions here for you guys. Can you provide any insight on which photons are best to enter into the canopy? 
as far as like what spectrum penetrates the best, I think is the best way to answer that question. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, and it, yeah, it's typically the, the spectrums that have higher red levels than blue. So uh, you're, you know, you're flowering, um, what we call our, our autumn spectrum. Uh, we end up with more penetration and uh, it just has a lot to do with what uh, frequencies uh, absorb at the top of the canopy versus kind of reflect a little bit and bounce down deeper before they get absorbed into the canopy. And what you will see from that autumn spectrum, uh, once you turn into that is it definitely is pretty close to the hue of an HPS light. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's why HPS has been really um, successful uh, in flowering cannabis, right? Is the, is the spectrum is uh, has uh, nice red levels in it. And, uh, and that's, um, you know, our LEDs are built around research that showed a lot of the same data there. So we, we build them that way as well. Awesome. And last question for you here, guys. I want to thank everyone in the audience again for attending. I want to thank Tom, Mike, and Alex for presenting today as well for today's webinar. Our last question before we go. And a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and emailed out to all attendees afterwards as well. So you'll have that available. Um, but before we go, guys, just one more question. Um, as you look to the future of LED lights, and as you mentioned, there's seemingly a new LED lighting company popping up every day. And as more and more people enter the cannabis industry, why should they go with Foes over uh, maybe another LED light provider? What separates you from um, other companies? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, I think there's a couple different factors that go into, you know, why you should choose Foes. Um, you know, as you guys alluded to, right, there's a lot of LED lighting companies coming on the market. Uh, a lot of these newer companies are basically just third party manufactured uh, lights from you know China or different places across the seas, um, and they slap their name on there. So with Foes, you obviously get you know credibility, right? We've been around for seven years. Um, we own manufacturing in both hubs that we operate in, um, so that does a, a lot, right? A lot of things that happen with LEDs. Um, a lot of folks always have complaints uh, around failure rates. Um, with Foes, you know we've operated on less than a one percent failure rate in the six and a half years that we've been operational. That all comes down to us owning our manufacturing, right? We put the utmost quality components into each and every one of our, our fixtures from the Samsung 301H series chips to Inventronics drivers to you know uh, the aluminum extrusion that we use. Um, we pot every single fixture so that way it's made for commercial growing, right? No dust, no water, no mites or anything like that can get into our fixtures. And I, I think that data is, is always king. Um, you know, when we founded this company, we did not want to be a Me Too fixture. Um, so we spent two and a half years of just doing peer research and development, you know, what the plant likes, what it doesn't, how far can we push these plants, and really got the kind of special sauce with the three different spectrums that Alex and team were able to build, create, and design. Um, and then also kind of pointing back to the data, right? We have a ton of case studies. Uh, we open up all of our clients. So if you guys are interested in making the switch over to Foes, you know, like I said, just go to our website, fill out a form. We'll have someone reach out to you. Um, we're happy to get you on the phone with our clients across the globe that have seen success. And they're happy to share that uh, with our potential clients as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's fairly simple, right? We put more photons down to the canopy at a higher efficiency and have the ability to navigate different spectrums to give the plant what it wants to not only increase your yields, but give all of our customers and partners uh, significantly higher quality medicine. So those are some of the main points. I didn't know if Alex or Mike had anything to add, but. Yeah, no, you did a good job covering it there. You know, our, our customer service is, is uh, something we pride ourselves on too. You know, it's, we don't drop the lights off and, and say good luck, you know, it's, uh, um, you have access to our horticulture team to help that transition from whatever your previous lighting was, or if it's a, a new project and a new build, you know, really, um, we can, we can aid in a lot of other ways that we don't charge for, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, um, we want our customers to be very successful. Um, so helping with how to feed appropriately and, and everything like that, and just, just general, uh, you know, advice we're here in every way we can be. You heard it right there, uh, right from Tom, Mike, and Alex about how foes can benefit your uh, cannabis cultivation. So again, want to thank each of you for uh, hosting today's session. I want to thank everyone for attending today's session as well. 
One more reminder, fohse.com is how you can get in touch with Tom, Mike, or Alex, or the entire team over there. And again, today's uh, webinar will be recorded and emailed out to all attendees. Please feel free to follow up if uh, anything is needed for any questions. And uh, again, Tom, Mike, Alex, thanks so much for your expertise and time today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Likewise, thanks for attending, everyone. Take care, guys.